Welcome to the Wild Tales podcast. I'm Jason Fox and this series is all about adventure, resilience and inspirational humans. The podcast is presented by the Book of Man and is supported by Talisker Single Malt Whiskey. My guests today are the Mad Explorers, two former Royal Marine Commandos who are currently in the midst of a record-breaking challenge to cross the Earth's five largest islands unsupported. As we'll find out, this is no easy task. As usual, we'll also be answering some questions that you've asked me on Instagram, and I'm going to be sending a bottle of my favourite Talisker to the top question I pick out. In addition, Maltz.com are offering a 10% off promo code, which is Talisker15DE. That's all in uppercase. Redeemable at checkout on www.maltz.com until the 1st of October 2020. Discount may only be used once for individual Talisker Distillers Edition products for sale at £100 or less. No minimum spend, but a delivery charge may apply. Not to be used in conjunction with any other offer and gift card purchases are excluded. 18 plus and subject to malts.com terms of sale. Here we go and I hope you enjoy it. Right, here they are, the Mad Explorers. Um, this has been a long time coming. Uh, they are basically a duo known as Louie and Ant, although Ant is also known as Chicken for some reason. But um, Ant, Ant has actually been pestering me for a long time and I've actually been wanting to get them both on for a long time. But, it, you know, time doesn't work out. Ant spends most of his time underwater. Louis spends most of his time under a ginger beard. And so here we are. We're eventually round to it. The mad explores are here. Um, mate, and I'll start with you first. Can you tell me what the Mad Explorers is all about? Yeah, no problem. So uh, Louis and myself, we both served in the core together, uh, like yourself. Um, and the then core, just quickly, the core being the Royal Marines. There we go. Yeah, we both served in the Marines together, um, and. We came back from Afghanistan in 2011 and we both got drafted to uh, Commando Logistic Regiment and we were both fairly threaders, as we call it, like which was sickened by our situation. And, and uh, I decided to put my notice in. Louis, um, Louis was doing his own thing and, and uh, we decided like from our time in the Marines, we, di- we didn't want like our last adventure, our last real cool thing that we did to be like Afghanistan and, and have that define us. Uh, so we met, we met up a few years after I'd left the Corps and Louis was uh, in the process of leaving. And we got our heads together and, and decided, um, well, we'd keep the adventure going, um, but do something completely different to what we'd done. So we dreamt up this idea to be the first humans to cross the planet, uh, to cross the five largest islands on the planet, unsupported, only using human power. And those islands are Borneo, New Guinea, Madagascar, Baffin Island, and Greenland. So they they encompass like a wide range of different environments. Um, they're all probably some of the, the last wildernesses, true wildernesses left on the planet. So in terms of um, a USP, like that was our USP for the expeditions and hopefully we thought it, w- it would enable us to get a lot of, you know, brands and sponsors on board um, to come along with the journey because we were, we were both fairly miserable in our, with our respective situations at the time. Um, and like I said, we didn't want Afghanistan and that, that time of our lives to define, you know, what we were going to do moving forward with our lives. Like. Awesome. So just quickly for any, everyone else listening, um, put your notice in means you're going to leave or you want to leave. The core is the Royal Marines and getting drafted means you get sent somewhere else. You basically move out. Um, Louis, what, what, how, did you, how did you come up with that, that challenge, you know, the five biggest islands? Because that is like, it is a big thing. I remember when I first heard about it, I was like, that's mental. You know, one island in itself is mental enough. You know, people crossing Antarctica or... or going to the North Pole, they're all quite, they're mental as well, but to pick the five biggest islands on the planet, which means they're pretty big. How how did that become a a thing? Yeah, well, 
in terms of size, like the, the islands are huge. Like our Greenland, our Borneo crossing was the same distance from London Heathrow to Rome. Like, so, so they're pretty big islands, you know. Um, but it came about, like Ant said, you know, I'd been medically discharged from the corn. I was, I was in psychologically pretty shit place, um, you know. And in terms of life going forwards, like, I just really, I really felt like I needed something that would provide an element of, of value to myself. I felt like I was actually achieving something new, something exciting for me. The thought of what was on offer just, you know, in your, your standard civvy job at the time, just wasn't doing it for me. So I knew some, I knew, you know, there was a big project on the cards or I wanted to get away and do something um, pretty special or at least felt special to me anyway. Um, so I sort of I sort of did the normal thing you do when you when you're having those shit days and just sort of got on the blower to my mate um, and, and and we we had a chat through. Firstly, do you just want to do you want to just do something, mate? And he was like, Yeah, mate, fucking what 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 are you thinking? And we'd both been to Borneo before. Um, and I said, Mate, what about crossing Borneo? You know, east to west crossing of Borneo. And we were like, You know, that'd be pretty special. It's a uh, it's an incredible place. It's got lots of crazy history with the Dyaks, the headhunters and all of that. And Ant came down to mine. We polished off a few bottles of scotch and we just fucking went through, you know, how hoofing it would be to cross Borneo. Um, and in our research, we found that that's the third largest island on the planet. So naturally, the mind, you know, the, the mind wonders, what's the, what's the second and the first? And that was Greenland and New Guinea. And they're both pretty exciting places. So I just wanted to know what the fourth and fifth was like what's the big five and it's um madagascar and baffin island again like two insane islands and we just thought you know fuck it should we have a punt at crossing both of them uh crossing all of them and it's important to note that neither of us have ever done anything like this like you know i've never i spent about three days on skis before we crossed greenland you know we've cuffed the whole thing really you know, it's just been, it's been a cuff from the start, to be honest. So how did you, um, before we, so what I'm going to do, just so people understand is I want to build, I want to take people on the journey that you went on, which means we're going to talk about the logistics and getting people involved in all that. But then, and then we're going to go and sort of like do snapshot of each, each island. Cause I know, I mean, each island is a, is a book in itself. So we've got, we've got to be, we've got to, box clever with this podcast and make sure that we, we we get what we want in and not not everything else as well because it would go on for bloody years but um once you hatch that plan um i'll, I'll go to ant again because obviously on zoom which means we've got to be careful with talking over each other but how then did you go about like getting interest so this this dream would become a reality uh it's a, a fairly prudent question that uh because that's probably been one of our biggest challenges, like from the conception. So, like in terms of the expedition, like what we'd fought up, um, it was in effect, you know, like it was very unique. Uh, like I said, it was our USP because you know we're not, we haven't got a lot of money, and we haven't got a lot of contacts in that world, um, and there's nothing really that unique about us. We're just a couple of disgrunt. We were a couple of disgruntled ex marines who wanted to do something a bit special with their lives. So the fact that we came up with this unique idea um, made it a lot easier for us to start getting a, you know, a lot of interest with what we were doing. Um, and what also helped is, is whilst Louis was uh, in the process of leave, leaving the Marines, he, he, was, um, he was going off to the Invictus Games um, where he met a lot of people that, that originally helped us get the ball rolling in terms of financial assistance and just putting us in contact with the right people in order to do this because, you know, like you can have all the will in the world to do an expedition like this and you can be, you know, really fit and, and be able to, to do them. But if, if you haven't got the equipment or the money in the bank, you, you're never going to get it done. So that was, and was and has been like our main hurdle moving forwards with these expeditions. How long was it? You know, so you've you've gone out there, you've gone to raise money, you've tried to get some brands on board, you've obviously got some on board and they've given you a bit quite a bit or some some support. When when 
when did you start getting kit in and you, you and you were there thinking crikey we've not, this is going to become a real thing you know we've got kit now and we've got we've got money that we can spend on flights to get places how how, how long was that louis it wasn't long because we deliberately planned borneo because we've both been there we knew that it's it's to a penny out there you can you can stretch your money a long way in borneo right so so we put borneo as the first one knowing that it's a relatively cheap expert to get off the ground so we had like a couple of grand in the pot and, you know, a few sets of jungle boots, some old kit that we prof from the core, you know, just, just it was mega cuffed, mate. And, and the truth is, you know, we, we'll talk about Borneo in a bit, but like we didn't have any provision for Kazivac. We didn't have, it, it was cuffed. It was on a shoestring. We just pretty much had what, had what we got probably within a few months of the idea. We were on a plane to Kalimantan and we were yomping from the East Coast into the wilderness with not a great deal made to be honest so it was it was pretty pretty raw and pretty cuffed okay that's a, <laughs> so basically again a little bit of a translation proft means acquired sometimes not legally but yeah that's what proft means and and grizzit and all those other things are what they sound like but um all right, so it, it it was quick. It was moving. I suppose each each island was its own expedition and its own budget, wasn't it in itself? Um, and with that in mind, let's move on to the first island that you cracked, which is Borneo. Uh, I know for a fact that you pretty much did it in your pants and a pair of jungle boots with carrying a rucksack and a few odds and ends inside. But give us a lowdown. How, how in a snapshot, how hard was it? Some stories that went with it. And how good was it to know that you'd finished and you'd crossed Borneo on your feet? Well, on a few different things, but mainly your feet. Uh, well, to start with, like, so we got out to Borneo. Um, and I think within the first two days, like, we realised, like, how stupid we'd been in, like, you know, thinking that it was going to be... We, well, we didn't think it was going to be a breeze, but we thought, you know, like, we had... A, we had our marine egos and our marine mentality on our backs and we kind of thought you know we'll just yomp it out and we'll get through it within the first day we realized clearly um this wasn't going to be the case and i remember we were mar we were we were walking out out of this uh town on the east coast um and we were walking to another settlement about 30 kilometers away we had about 35 40 kilos on our back walking through equatorial heat and like we we were just broken like, and we were like, Jesus, we got 1500 kilometers ahead of us. Um, and that first night, as we walked into this settlement, there was this uh, little little old lady called Shinta who she'd had polio in her youth. So she was walking bow legged. Um, she just came out, came out of nowhere and came up to us, sp uh, like spoke to us in Bahasa, asked us what we were doing, explained to her. And she ended up taking us both to her house, like, bringing us in a house. She lived in this little shoe shoe shop where she made all the shoes and backpacks and stuff in the, in the back. And she fed us and let us stay there for the night. And that was like moving forward. That was like a common theme through the expedition. Like people were so interested in what we were doing, like even though we were broken and, and really hurting a lot of the time, like you'd get complete strangers just inviting you straight into their houses um, and just treating us like a member of the family, even though we couldn't speak, you know, um, a word of English, but uh, um, even though they couldn't speak a word of English, well, we can't either. So, but, but moving forward, um, there was a huge area of uncertainty in the expedition, which was the Mulashwana mountain range, and we dubbed it the death zone. So when planning the route, um, we realised we could get as far west as this area called the death zone, and then there was a 40 kilometres patch through jungle and mountains where there was no settlements, no logging roads. Um, and then the other side, the settlements would start again. Um, so we knew this area of uncertainty was going to um, cause us some problems, but we, we thought if we could get to the last settlement on the, the east side, we'd be able to find a local that would know, know the way. Um, and relying on that caused us several problems indeed. Like, I'll pass this over to Louis, um, if you like, there, because... Yeah, well, yeah, it was it was dodgy. So we got to the end of this, like, we just assumed that there's a settlement, so the tribal dudes must be crossing this patch of mountain. 
must be, but they weren't. And they basically said the upshot was this gnarly tribal dude called Bapa Chagau, who looked like a, you know, Dayak legend with his massive machete, naked, ripped. You know, he was like, I'll, I'll, I'll take you through the mountains if you want, but it's going to be hard, you know. And uh, we were like, happy days, we'll, we'll be fine. And uh, we got up, got up into the mountains and um, he just, he literally within the blink of an eye just disappeared and he was just gone. And uh, so we were sort of up in the mountains on our own. We decided to press on and Mullish Warner mountain range are like two and a half, three thousand meters. Their footprint is around the size of whales, like they're enormous. And um, we were like day by day getting more bull bags and more bull bags running out of scran and it got down to like one day without scran and then it was like two days with no food and then it was like morning free waking up and we hadn't eaten for three days and we were still like looking these maps we had that were from i think 1970 something they were from they were the only maps we could get and it was like we could we could die here you know um so we looked on the map and there was like this headwater away from our route like a river and we thought if we can get on the river surely we can just like fashion a raft or something and just like float down to civilization and uh we made it to the we made it to the river and we were properly on our ass by this point we managed to cuff a bamboo raft together that was just barely floated with us both on and we started going down the river um but we hit like these there was loads of fallen fig this river was like probably like you know big river there's loads of fallen fig trees and shit you know what jungle rivers are like they're dodgy aren't they and uh our bamboo wrap i got smashed into one of these logs and just got fucked off i just remember seeing him getting like ragged old over me and i got sucked down under this log and i just remember like the pressure in my ears was like, and i was just stuck under the water and i was like right mate you know don't flap just square yourself away you know and I was like, breath was hanging out. I was trying to move. I could just feel this slippery lock. And I was like, don't flat, mate. It's going to be all right, you know. And it got down to like curtains time. And I was like, mate, you know, you're just going to, you're going to die. You're going to die under a fucking log in Borneo. And uh, I managed to like, almost like, had almost like a fit and, and shook my whole body with everything I had. And I got sucked under this log and fired up out. And luckily, Ant had seen what had happened and was like on this shingle beach down there and managed to catch me and like drag me in and, you know, d did a bit of jumping up and down on me and shit. And I was, um, I sort of came to all dazed. And that was when I think first time I thought, this is, you know, this is fucking gnarly. We could, we could die doing this, you know. Um, and do you want to crack on, mate? Yeah, so, so we got to that point. Um... And then we carried on sailing down the river and eventually we, we made it to the easternmost settlement in this area of West Kalimantan that was on the, on the river. And when we got down there, there was loads of kids and that play, playing in the rivers. They saw us coming from, you know, the heart of the jungle and they vanished. Um, and then they reappeared with a load of, a load of blokes with parangs and we were like, oh shit, we've just... We just made it through like the death zone only to get hacked to death by some fucked off diacs like but they came over started chatting to us and we explained like what we'd just done and they couldn't believe that we'd just come over those mountains they were just like fucking idiots like and then they brought us in um brought us into their longhouse and we spent spent the night just like soaking wet just like collapsed to sleep on each other like ate a load of food and then the next morning, the Kapaladesa, which is like the, the head honcho of the, the village, um, took us down to the waterfront and he sold us like this old water taxi that he bought up from Sintang, which was like the main settlement further down river. So like we parted with him and we got like a decent, a decent vessel that we jumped on board. And then we ended up taking that down the Sungai Malawi, which was a river we were on. And then we joined the the Sungai Kapuas, which is the largest island river on the planet. It's massive, and it's a big like logging highway. Uh, so you have all these barges just towing, uh, like all the the uh, looted bounty of the the jungles downstream. Mm -hmm. So we ended up just paddling down this river until we hit the tidal delta, yeah. and then the tides were just pushing us back way too much. So, um, and by this point, like the 
the the raft was so, the, the boat was so battered we um we ended up just ditching it and then yomping the last of the way in as mental mate i've got to say with all of that going on what happened to that dude that said he was going to take you over the mountains and then just did one <laughs> i said oh mate he's he's probably still out there just Telling, telling all the locals about how he saw off these white guys. Well, I think, good, based on doing it, I think good effort. I'm not surprised he thinned out. <laughs> okay, so that that's um, that's Borneo. Just um, when it comes to Borneo, I mean, it's obviously the jungle. I know the jungle, but it just eats away at you, doesn't it? It just like completely. Just for people listening, the jungle is one of the most hostile. There's lots of hostile environments, but that place. It eats you rot from you know you rot from places on your body that you don't want to rot from and from and um, everything in the jungle it plants animals a lot they just it just tries to sort of have a pop at you it's always trying to get you eat you try and kill you but um, did you take any sort of like techie equipment so you you know you know when you're in those sort of like sticky situations was there ever a, an option to like you know, speak to someone and let them know what was going on. Uh, yeah, we had a sat phone. Um, we had a sat phone, but it was pretty limited in terms of coverage and, and um, stuff like that. So we, we, we just kept it buried in the Bergen, waterproofed. The thing is, though, yeah. you know, we had a means of communication, but we didn't have a means of anybody coming to get us. So other than just calling, calling your mum to say, all right, mum, you know, we're having a great time. It, you know, the reality was where we were, you know, there was no real contingency plan. Yeah, it's just just crack on. We, yeah. You'll be all right. Yeah. Uh, okay, mate. For actually, did you capture anything on camera? Yeah, we got plenty on camera. We got we got given a camera at the start the start of it all, um, a broadcast spec one, and uh, you know we were like advised just get as much as you can. So we we filmed pretty much. All, we've been pretty much all the expeditions on camera so I mean there's plenty of footage um, but just we don't have a clue what to do with it <laughs> so uh, Borneo finished what's the next one which one did you start to do Guinea. so in terms of we came home and like there was you know like we said a couple of times where we obviously got ourselves in way over our head and we were very naive in thinking that we could just you know cuff it and crack on like the way that we did so we both agreed like once we'd successfully got Borneo in the back bag that we were never ever going to leave anything like that to chance again especially in in the fact that we were going for, from a, an island like Borneo where where it's very jungly very mountainy but the people are incredibly friendly friendly and we were going from there to Papua New Guinea which is probably one of the most violent countries on earth Mm. Uh, so we realized um we couldn't be carrying on like the way we did in borneo in papua new guinea and we have to plan a lot more in advance which we did we got um put in touch with a lot of like local guys on the ground who you know wh when i planned my route i could get, i got in touch with them beforehand and they they in turn ended up putting me with locals on the ground who could guide us sa safely from village to village um so it was a whole whole different kettle of fish, like planning that compared to planning Borneo, where we just kind of, you know, thought, oh, we'll just cuff it, which is, you know, I would not do an expedition like that ever again. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> Louis, can you explain a little bit about Papa in a nutshell? And then <clears throat> can you tell us a couple of stories with any hairy moments with the locals? Because they have been renowned for being a little bit volatile. Yeah, obviously, just to give you an idea, like Papua New Guinea is like, it's like something out of Jurassic Park. It's like when you see that scene on Jurassic Park with the big massive waterfall coming out the side of a mountain jungle, it's pretty much like that. Mountain ranges are up to like four and a half thousand meters all over the shop. The jungle's mega dense, very unexplored, violent, you know, the, the inter-tribal warfare there. Every 20K you go, you hit a new tribe and they're scrapping with the tribe next door. In a lot of cases, butchering each other with machetes, you know, in broad daylight. Um, when we got there, uh, we spoke to the chief of police who was just, uh, it's quite corrupt there. Spoke to the chief of police there and, and we said to him like, mate, what's the sketch of us getting, you know, 
whacked on the, on the route and he said it's it's pretty tasty there's fighting all over the shop and uh he said um i just have my little machete and he said can you chop i said what do you mean he was like chop 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 i was like what in the jungle i was like yeah 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 he was like if you get attacked in the jungle you just chop them up chop them up chop them up don't tell anyone it's fine so we had like license to kill from the chief of police after we'd been in the country for like a few hours you know um so we sort of we sort of bounced bounced from settlement to settlement until we we're in the rural proper jungle um but the the ones to be, the people to be really wary of are, are like a gang called the rascals and they they're like these dudes that are like in between tribal dudes and western dudes they're like proper tribal guys but they're like you know they know what money is and and there's a big campaign in Papua New Guinea between the Japanese and, and the Australians during the Second World War. So there's a ton of munitions left in the jungle. So these rascals will go into the jungle, find a couple of old shooters and get them working again, and then go into the go into a village that they want to square away and just and just massacre a load of people there. So we were walking down this highway one day, and um, this land cruiser went past us with a load of sort of smoke billowing out. And I thought, that looks dodgy. In a place where there's like, there's never really any wagons kicking around. I was like, that looks dodgy, but carried on yomping. And my feet were in a shit state, so I was preoccupied on my feet. And uh, then I like looked back and this thing had swung round and like these dudes came out. And you know what, like, you know what Pacific Islander dudes look like? They're pretty scary. They're like, they're st- they're stacked, aren't they? Most of them, like Fijians and that, and they all chew beetle nuts. They got like red teeth, mm. red eyes, big machetes, and he basically had this gun that he'd made out of a staple gun, uh, a barrel, and it had like a point five round in it, and he just smashed it into my face, and uh, started gobbing off. And I was like, great, you know, whether he wants to shoot me or not, this dude's going to blow my blow my head off and probably his arm at the same time. Um, so I was flapping and there's all these other dudes kicking around, big drive dudes. And um, Ant sort of took charge of negotiations and sort of managed to talk them round to giving them a bit of dosh to take a safe passage to the next village, just oversee us. They sort of agreed to it and we sort of ended up yomping along with these like rascal dudes for like 15k down this highway and got to a settlement. Um, I mean, there was there was many occasions on that expedition where we had shooters or machetes put in our face, um, you know, where we come across dead dead people that have been, you know, scrapping with each other and that. Um, you, we could talk forever about the, the close encounters that we had there. Um, so, yeah, it was pretty pretty dodgy. It's, it is mental. Like, I've got this vision of Papua New Guinea being this untouched place, which it obviously is. But obviously, you know, yeah. when you talk about the violence there, it, it's something you, if you didn't know about it itself, then you would never suspect it because you just think it's like this untouched jungle island in the middle of the Pacific. But it's, it's weird because that is the case. That is the case. Once you get away from the coast, like it is pristine essence jungle, um, but there's just these pockets of savagery. Mm. Um, you did allude on to something there, so I'm going to ask Ant to tell us a little bit about this because I know you did see it. And um, that's like, were there any? Was there anything interesting that you found in the jungle? Maybe um, you know stuff that you wouldn't expect to see, but then when you see it, you're like, oh, wow. So I, I don't know if you're talking about um, in terms of the the all the World War Two stuff that's out there. So like we we, we planned the route. I I like when I was when I was planning for the expedition, I got like a load of old World War II diaries and books that had been been um, wrote by Australian soldiers. And there's like a, there is a tourism industry in Papua New Guinea kind of geared up to this as a track by Port Moresby where a lot of the fighting went on. Um, but a- away from that, there is all these old fighting areas Dakota, right. because of the infrastructure of the country, like tourists can't get there. And, and so a lot of these battlefields and stuff have been taken over by the jungle. So we went along one called Shaggy Ridge, which was where it is a two and a half thousand meter high ridge line. um, And it's about two meters wide in places. And the Australian commandos had to take that um, from the 
the Japanese that controlled it. So they were doing fighting up this like mud bank jungle cliff, um, which probably was some of the fiercest fighting of the war. And they were all you know running along this two and a half meter wide ridge line, taking the positions from the Japanese. Well, we went along this ridge line and like there's still a, a Japanese a heavy machine gun still in place there. Like the, the barrels there, the tripods there, um, they've still got all the foxholes everywhere. And we were walking along, finding um, grenades that were still there, you know, completely rusted and old, old uh, rounds and stuff all over the shop. And it's just in the middle of the jungle, in the middle of Papua New Guinea, it's just, it was mind boggling to be walking along there. And we were on our asses walking along there thinking, Jesus, imagine having to, to fight on this kind of terrain, it would have been horrendous for the guys that were doing it. That's awesome. It was almost as if they'd have just up sticks and left it there. And then made it, yeah. did it feel like you were the first people since just to be like, wow, what the fuck's this all about? Well, that's what it felt like. And there's pl plenty of, like, there was plenty of other things. So we were, when we'd moved down from the Shaggy Ridge, we went through an another area where they'd had loads of dogfighting between the planes. And like, we came across a Japanese zero. It was just in the middle of a, a field of kunai grass, which is just like the grass that grows on the plains out there. It grows way above head height. And uh, it was just, just there. Like we were chatting with a local. He's like, oh yeah, there's a plane over here. And he just took us to this, this zero. And then the next day we were in a village chatting with the locals in this village. Um, like, you know, one of these typical PNG villages where all the houses are made out of bamboo and palm leaves and that. We, we were talking and they said, oh yeah, we've got a, we've got a plane out the back here. So they just, yomped us a kilometre away and there was a big bomber that was buried next to a tree like they'd obviously just ditched and and uh i think the locals go see if there's anything worth taking and and then they've just left them like wow, that's mental mental how long did um how did long did papa take papa new guinea took us 28 days and we walked from north north to south and it was uh just over 800 kilometers that journey so it's a bit shorter journey than borneo but yeah. um more probably with the human factor more dangerous do you reckon yeah a lot more dangerous in like it's probably the most incredible place i've ever been in my life like it's it is amazing it is like you know like what you said like a jungle paradise and it's been untouched relatively so because probably of the fact that you know that the it can't be exploited that much for tourism because of you know, how dangerous it is and logistically, in order to, to rape the country like a lot of these logging companies and multinational corporations do, um, logistically, it's a lot more difficult to do than somewhere like Borneo because of the fact that all the resources are on these massive mountains. I mean, it's still going on. There's still a lot of um, exploitation going on in, in PNG from the, the big Chinese and Australian logging and mining companies. But compared to what was going on in Borneo, it's, it's massively yeah, yeah. So that's, that's new, uh, Papua New Guinea done. Um, what was it, which one was the next one on your list? Madagascar we did next. Go on then, let's, 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 let's have that one. So yeah, we spent about, again, it took about a month in Madagascar. Um, obviously, <laughs> mega redders there and- um, <laughs> Mega hot, mega hot. Yeah, hot there. And uh, just before we were going, right, we were all prepped to go. And then I saw something on the news about a, out, the worst outbreak of the bubonic plague in Madagascar in like 50 years. This was like two weeks before we were supposed to go. So I got on the blower to Anne. I was like, mate, have you seen, um, you seen what's on TV about Madagascar? He was like, yeah, mate. I knew about the plague, but I didn't know how bad it was. And Anne's brother's a doctor. And... Uh, so he got on the blow to his bro and he said, you know, can you speak to any of your doctor mates that would be able to advise? And they basically all came back and said, yeah, don't go. Unless you have to go, don't go. So I was like, shit, you know, well, should we go or whatever? And uh, I remember one night we'd had a few wets and we were talking about whether we should call it or not. And it's still at this point, like financially, it was all on a shoestring. So we'd committed financially to quite a bit already. And if we, if we can, the expert, we would have lost a few grand. Yeah. And I said to Anne, like, should we go or not? Because this plague's killing a lot of people. And Anne just said, I've got zero interest in, um, he said, I've got, 
I got zero value for my own life, to be honest, mate. So you're <laughs> you're gonna have to make the call. <laughs> and I was like, all right, mate. <laughs> so I was like, all right, let's go. Uh, and we ended up going. And you know, a lot of people don't know it's the poorest country in Africa, Madagascar. It is properly, mm. properly poor country, redders and poor. And you know. It didn't take long till we were like out in the sticks. There's a little bit of jungle on the East Coast, but most of it's like arid desert. It didn't take long till we were out in the sticks till we realized like, we're gonna have to start man packing like 10 liters of water at minimum each to get through these settlements because loads of settlements didn't have water in like, or they'd have a muddy, muddy well with like the dregs of water. You can't rock up to these settlements as white rich dudes and start asking for water when the people there are literally, you know, hanging out. And, yeah. and soon it started to play on our mind quite heavy that as we're yomping across this country, like people are in such a shit state and we've put ourselves in this position, you know, and we come into these settlements where people are really struggling and, um, you know, there would be nothing really to eat other than rice, not a lot of water kicking around. We drunk from some real dodgy water sources. I got mega real, mega real one day. Um, but I think, yeah, for me, that in, in, a, in a weird way, the Madagascar expedition was quite hard psychologically, not so much physically. Um, well, it was hard physically, but it, it played a lot on my mind about like how we live our life in the Western world compared to these people and you know, we're putting ourselves in this position when, when those guys who live there would give anything to be sat in a place that I'm sat in now. So yeah. it was a peculiar expedition. It was, it was hard, but the lack of, the lack of water and, and seeing the state, some of the locals were in was, was hard work, I think. And then um, with it, because I always sit, you think, <laughs> I'm going to sound stupid now, but when you talk about Madagascar, you think of the, the, um, the, the cartoon film and you always think it's going to be dense jungle but it, it obviously isn't is it so like with madagascar the geography of the place kind of um sees it off a lot so you do have like the tropical jungle and it's all along the east coast so you've got this this maybe like 30 or 40 kilometers that go in that is all tro real tropical jungle um and it's all because of the humid air that blows off the indian ocean that hits a big plateau that sends it back on itself and, and it all rains and it's very tropical but then once you get the other side of the, the plateau we, me and me and louis were walking over one of these plateaus it was called the plateau de makira and like it was stunning it looked a bit like when we were on top of it a bit like dartmoor just rolling uh, quite arid green hills and then uh we were going up and up and up and we're just walking along this arid greenness for days on end and then like the well just dropped away in front of us and it was just like like afghanistan like red red soil and as far as the eye could see like this barren like red soil where these really poor people were living um and like we said there was an outbreak of the, the plague when we were there like as soon as we got off the plane we got handed these pamphlets by the who that were on the ground um and he was saying about you know the plague being prevalent and we were going through these communities where people were dying of the, the bubonic plague. And it's such, it's, it's so, it was so difficult to see like a disease that is so easily treated. If you catch it early, you just need a course of doxycycline. So we were taking that anyway for anti-malarials. And we, when we were going through these villages, we were just making sure we dose up on it a bit more. Um, but we were going through like seeing these, this disease that's so easily treated um, and, and seeing kids and, 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 the, the residents of these villages just dying because they didn't have access or the education to to access these drugs and it was it was bad. for me I felt like real bad about being on like our own little adventure going into you know what is a living hell for a lot of the people that were there so I asked yeah. questions of, of myself and yeah. what we were doing when we were on that journey like it it sounds like Madagascar was a um was yeah like Louis said was tough psychologically because Borneo was more of an adventure I suppose you've been there before everyone was you know the villagers look after themselves Papua New Guinea was a little bit more dangerous but they knew what was going on and you know it, you were aware of the fact that it was dangerous and then you get to Madagascar and that's a different kettle of fish all of a sudden 
you just see proper proper poverty is that right would it be yeah, that yeah that's a... right and I, when i was in Papua, when i was in Papua new guinea i do remember like um there was one of the locals there was saying you know like sometimes they'll come into money and when they come into money they will just drink it like they'll they'll spend that money so fast everyone just buy drinks and buy their family stuff and buy presents because at the end of the day the jungle when they're living in the jungle the jungle provides everything for them there's always water there there's always like you know wood and that to make a house and there's plentiful food so the fact that they're really poor out in Papua New Guinea makes no difference for the, the communities living in the jungles because it provides them with everything once you stray away from the jungle and you're living in these environments where you're solely reliant on the rains coming um, and that's you know there's no infrastructure to protect you um, it gets you know a, lo a lot more damaging yeah yeah and so then we move on to um Greenland where obviously there's hardly anyone lives and it's absolutely Baltic so obviously you know there was of I, I would hazard a guess that there was a bit more planning needed because you needed to take more kit and you needed to probably am I right in thinking that you needed to train a little bit more albeit three days I suppose yeah I mean there's it's less cuffable than rocking up in Borneo with a pair of jungle boots and machete you have to have your shit in one sock to a degree. Um, and like I said at the beginning, we've cuffed all of these expeditions. Like, I'm, I'm no polar explorer. Like, you know, it's when, we, when we skied across Greenland, that's the first time I've ever really done any proper cross-country skiing. Um, and, and led on a lot of the prep for Greenland. Um, so he became like the little, the little Jedi of skiing and that he went out to Norway for a few weeks and did a lot of the admin with a little polar mentor um, Norwegian chap that gave us some good advice um, but yeah there was more planning involved but it was it's a weird one Greenland because although it's a massive challenge and there is challenges like you know Ant will probably spin you the cre a crevasse dit in a minute um, you know there's crevasses crevasse fields and shit like that once you get on up on the ice cap you just ski on a bearing you know we skied for an hour we took 10 minutes break we skied for an hour took 10 minutes break we did that for 12 14 hours a day for 30 days and as long as you're really strict on your drills in terms of like if you need to get out of your rack and uncover the tent then you just got to get out of your rack and uncover the tent as long as you don't wrap it's in a way it's simpler than dealing with tribes like in PNG, mm. you, you have to play the game with the tribes. You've got to smoke what they're smoking and drink what they're drinking after you've been yomping 12 hours. You just want to get your head down and you end up shiters in some weird, you know, tripping in some weird, like, diac <laughs> bamboo shelter, dehydrated. At least in Greenland, you knew if you cover this ground today, we get the tent up, there's a hot wet in there, you know, there's a sleeping bag in there. You can get your head down. Mm. So it's quite like a real regimented, simple way of life up until the crevasse fields, essentially. So it's basically, a, it was the, it, it, it almost forced you into the routine you should have had in all the other places, but you couldn't because the people were involved. Yeah, basically, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then, so obviously there's a lot of skiing involved. You're pulling sledges or polks, whatever people want to call them, uh, which... I should hazard a guess that will weigh quite, they weighed quite a bit. Um, mate, tell us, um, tell us about the crevasses because Louis dying for you to tell us that story. <laughs> so you've got like two sets of crevasse fields in, like on the route that we were doing through Greenland. You've got like the, the East Coast and the West Coast. And we managed to get through the East Coast crevasse fields. Uh, well, relatively unscathed. There was a point I nearly fell through one, um, mm. but I managed to lean back on my, um, and it was only because like uh, I was I was Fred as I was really annoyed with my skis because they were building up loads of snow because they had like a layer of water that was sticking the snow to them. So I took them off, and then as I took them off, I stood I stood and I didn't realise I was sat on a I was stood on a crevasse. So I, I went straight through, but I managed to lean back and sit back. But the the real gnarly um, time we had was was once we'd cross once we'd cross the ice cap and we were going down what's called the ice fall which is on the West Coast, is a, is a massive vast field. And it's, it's basically what it says it is. It's, it's huge chunks of ice 
that the are about the size of houses just all over the place and it's where the ice cap descends into into land and on the last day before we were hitting this ice ice fall like louis had gone snow blind in one eye so like <laughs> we, we were heading into this crevasse field with like one one of us half blind and the other one of us like having to take the lead on this on the navigation and that we were walking through this crevasse field and it was starting to get dark and uh we knew like if we pushed on we'd, we'd get off the uh the ice cap that night so we were like right we're going to push on into the evening probably not our smartest idea but we, we were fairly fredders with you know ice everywhere so we were going through this real dodgy bit where there was like a cliff it was a cliff that went down and onto a ledge and then down into a crevasse and so i'd, I'd led forward and I, I turned to louis i said look this this is real dodgy mate so just watch your foot in as so i followed followed down and the poles were being a nightmare because we didn't have rigid harnesses we had we just had them attached by ropes so when we were going over dodgy patches like that the poles were just going wherever they wanted and like louis <laughs> Louis just, <laughs> Louis just came over this like little ledge and I just watched like almost in slow motion, watched his hulks like jackknife and then just drag him straight into, into this crevasse. Uh, and like, <laughs> luckily he landed on the ledge, um, but he still fell a good few meters, like smash, smashed his head and he's just lying there. His two pokes still hanging on him down in the crevasse and he's lying on this ledge. And like I'm shouting down to him and there's nothing coming back from him. He woke up and then was like, what am I doing down here? Fucking don't worry about that, mate. So like rigged up some ropes and got him out. And then like once we got him out, he was just, he just turned to me and was like, chicken, where's my Bergen? And I was like, what? He was like, where's my Bergen, chicken? I was like, nah, you've not had a Bergen on this whole expedition, mate. Like, you've got all your gears in the pulk. He's like, no, nah, where's my Bergen? I was like, don't worry about it. We're just going to get off the ice and then we'll come back and get your Bergen. Don't worry. <laughs> we just, yeah. So that was, yeah. <laughs> How deep do you reckon was the... Like, obviously, Louis fell onto a ledge, but if he'd have got... I mean, he'd have gone, would he? Oh, that'd have been, yeah. Good night, Vienna. I don't know if you've ever been snow blind, but I was properly snow blind in one eye and it was hanging out to the point where it was patched over and it was dark. So I was going through a crevasse field in the dark with one eye and I couldn't even have a head torch on my head because the pain was so sore. So Ant was like 20 meters ahead of me doing all the navin, And uh, yeah, probably won't be doing that in a hurry again, snow blind, because I nearly creamed in bad. How long, how long did Greenland take? 30, was it 31 days? And you did, and if I remember rightly, because yeah. I, I spoke to you, and about it um, ages ago. You you told me about that place you came across. Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll let Louis talk to you about it. Like it's mental. <laughs> oh, die two, are you talking about? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there's like, um, there's this old, like, it's called die two. It's um, a, a US air base that was put there during the Cold War um, as part of the early warning system from any Russian missiles and um, it's like something out of James Bond it's like um, this massive Cold War bunker with a huge golf ball radar dome on the top um, that's that was left in the Cold War I think 80 I can't remember in the 80s it was it was just 86 yeah 86 just totally left and um, it's just like been frozen in time you know, everything is just as it was, you know, in there. It's like, there's still bedding, there's still people's kit, there's still people's photos of loved ones up, letters. There's like an ops room in there. There's a pool table in there, a bar. Like it's massive and it's slowly getting swallowed by the ice. The, the Greenland's like swallowing this huge building. Um, but it's bizarre. It's like, um, it's like something off a horror film or like James Bond. So. That was sort of two thirds into our expedition. We came across that, which was hoofing because it's it, the horizon's just so flat, and to try and navigate on just like grey patches of snow becomes a real ball lake. So when we saw like this tiny, it looked like a speck of sand on the horizon. We knew we could just navigate towards Die Two, and it was it was a good bit of morale to get there and have a have a look around and that. Yeah, I mean that's that is 
Oh, it's just mental, isn't it? To like go into somewhere. They must have just properly evacuated as well. Just ditched it and left it. Because most of the time, when you get a chance, you just pack up everything you've got, all your belongings, and then leave it empty. But Yeah, I think, I think because of the cost of like maintaining it and everything, once the threat had gone from... It was, the, it was because the main threat was Soviet bombers flying over, and then that threat changed into to intercontinental ballistic m- missiles, which that radar station wouldn't have done anything against. So once the, that threat had gone, like in terms of the, the amount it costs to run and maintain, like I think because it would have cost so much to bring everything out because of how remote it was, they just said like, look, get everyone out, leave everything there, um, and we'll just, you know, write it all off. We scrammed a bit of peanut butter that was still kicking around there in the store. It was mega dry. Uh, <laughs> that, that means they ate a bit of peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> Scrand it. Um, you did. You've cracked the four. You've cracked those four islands. It's called Expedition Five. Oh, by the way, they're doing it for charity, Help for Heroes, and the Royal Marines charity. Uh, but you know, Baffin Island is the last island, and I know you've had a few dramas with getting that that final piece of the Exped Five puzzle sort of put into place. When when are you looking at doing that one? I mean, ideally, in an ideal world, we would have been doing it this year. Financially, we couldn't. In the end, one of our sponsors didn't deliver. And then, so now we're looking at next year. It's probably a good job it didn't happen this year because we'd have been stranded out in Baffin Island with a load of, you know, Inuits just living in living in their settlement and they, they'd have been getting fredders with us. So... Um, ideally because of the weather and we need a good amount of sea ice so that the polar bears aren't going to be on the land because there's only two of us and we can't realistically be cracking a bear sentry um ideally we need need it to be in around march time next year so if we manage to get everything in one sock um we're gonna aim to, to head out on this one and we've left this one to last for a reason because this is probably going to be one of the most challenging ones we've done in terms of geography it's going to be a very similar climate to Greenland but the the terrain is so much more technical Um, there's mountains all over the shop there's huge frozen lakes and there's like we're planning on ascending an ice cap along a route that's never ever been been used so you know it's truly a world first this one that we're going to be doing Um, but obviously we need to get everything in order to be able to, to successfully do it. Can you explain, can you explain to the listeners um, whereabouts Baffin is? Yeah, so Baffin, if, if you go to the west coast of Greenland and look straight out towards Canada, it's the first landmass that, that you'll hit. So it's, it's owned by Canada. It's a Canadian island, but there's, I think there's a population of about 10,000 and it's all small Inuit communities that are dotted around on the coast. Um, so it's, it's a quintessentially a polar island that's like Scotland on steroids. And toppers with polar bears. It's, it's got a, I think it's one of the only places on the planet where the polar bear population is increasing at the moment. So it, it really is proper. That is where polar bears live. Proper job, you know. So Bonus, what, what sort of protection? You, I mean, you, you're going to take it, but you obviously don't want to use it. The last thing you'd want to do is is do anything like that. And the re- the reality is, I learned this in Greenland. It's nice to have a shooter on you for the bears. You got loads. Of, you got like two pairs of mitts on your hands. You're ball bagged. It's cold. Goggles on. If a bear wants to maul you, you're not going to get the shooter out in time. You know, if a bear maul you, yeah. then you're going to get. I think like my my main protection for the bear is is going to make sure that I can ski faster than Louis. <laughs> Lou, Louis's the decoy, um, <laughs> mate. That's awesome. I mean, what is it? What is it you've liked about all of that? You know, the exploring side of it. What have you? Ignore the charity side of things. Ignore each island individually. What is the best thing so far with the four islands? From like a personal standpoint, it's given me it's given me a hell of a lot of perspective in terms of I'm quite clear on, I'm quite clear on what I need in life to just be a happy dude. You know, I think I've, I've, I've 
squared a lot of demons. I've had a lot of thinking time. You know, when you're when you're in your own head, like in Greenland, you got goggles on, a mask on, hood up, and it's just white, pretty much on your own for twelve hours a day for thirty days. There's a lot of time to think about a lot of stuff, um, and I think from a personal standpoint, I've I've processed a lot of stuff, and I think I've got I, I'm getting a real good perspective on on life and what's really important for me. It's been been a life changing experience so far, and it, and it's definitely without those islands, you wouldn't have got to that place, would you? Because you you know the normal noise of everyday life probably wouldn't allow it. No, nah, I think without Without the project, to be honest, with the mindset I was in, I wouldn't like to to consider where I would have ended up or what I would have ended up doing, to be honest. Good effort. You and what about you? What's been the all all encompassing thing? Um where probably um it really has like restored my faith in humanity doing this. Like the the random acts of kindness that we've been shown throughout this. Uh, endeavor you know like from day almost day one where we met Shinta and she took us into her, her house or uh, for example there was a there was a when we were when we finished the expedition in Papua New Guinea we were on a thing called a, a, a where it was a PMV which is like their their version of a bus but it's just a truck where people go on the back and it was all filled with beetle nuts and like me and Louis had gone on the back of this this truck and we were going into Port Moresby the capital and we stopped because the, the driver needed to sell his, his um, beetle nut. And there was like a load of tires on fire in the, middle of the, in the middle of the highway. And there were loads of rascals kicking about. And all the locals in the back, they were like, if, they were like you've got to come in, you've got to hide. So we were just hidden by all these locals because they, they were saying if these rascals had seen us, because we're two white tourist looking blokes, they, they'd have just robbed us. So like we were just getting complete strangers looking after like us like that. And it's been like the, the theme recurring, you know, from the very beginning that the people mm. on this planet are fucking amazing. Like, you know, and it's quite easy to lose sight of that, you know, especially living in the West where we're constantly looking for someone to blame or a group of people to blame for, you know, what's wrong with the world. So for me, that probably has been, you know, the main thing that I've took from these expeditions. That's awesome, mate. Good effort. Um, lads, after Baffin, whenever, when that happens, um, do you think there'll be another challenge? And if, if so, what? We're, go we're going to P&G with you, Foxy. <laughs> okay, there we go. We've, that's, that's it. It's out. We're going to do a trip to P&G. I wanted to go. I've always wanted to go. I've got another friend that's been. And so, yeah, let's do that. You can, you can basically babysit me in P&G. <laughs> um mate that's sort of pretty much coming to the end of the podcast with you know with times cracking on but what i normally do now and what i do do and what i will do now is um we get people to uh fire in a few questions on instagram for you guys and then i've got to pick one out the person that i pick out uh gets sent a bottle of talisker so um so this one is from kml underscore ben it says, you've obviously spent a lot of time together on adventures. What are each other's best and worst habits as an adventure oppo? Louis, you go first. All right. Um, I'll start with the worst. Worst thing for me is Anne snores like a fucking bush pig. And <laughs> my sleep here, I am dreadful at sleeping, even at home. Like, I really struggle to get my head down. And when I'm on my ass and I want to just sleep and you're sharing a tent with Anne, it's sometimes that can piss me off. Um, his best, I would say, or one thing I, I sort of admire about Anne um, is that he, his values are, he, he's not willing to, to um, budge on his values for anyone or for anything, regardless of the environment he's in. What is important to Ant is important to him and he's got a solid set of values and he he just, you know, he, he sticks by them regardless of what environments he's in. It could be in Mayfair in London or it could be some shithole in, in Madagascar. He's the same dude and I think that's that's something to be admired uh, in a person. And uh, So probably 
Louis's best and, and worst characteristics are probably the the same for me, which is like he is a realist where I can um I can sometimes get carried away with what we're doing. So that can present itself sometimes as despondency. Um and I can be like, fucking hell, you miserable cunt, cheer up. But other <laughs> other times, you know, we you know, where I can be like, ah, we can crack this, it'll be easy. And like Louis like, nah, you need to look at what we're what what you think that we're gonna do here because it's not gonna happen. So he he grounds me, which is very good because I, I could have probably got us killed a few times if it wasn't for him. Right, lads. Um it's been awesome talking to you. It's been awesome to find out about the four islands of the five cracks so far. And I'm like mega looking forward to hearing about the fifth one, Baffin. If people want to follow you, how can they do it? Yeah, so we're on Instagram as the Mad Explorers with an underscore between each one. We tried to change our name on Facebook, but I think because we call ourselves the Mad Explorers, uh, it's like derogatory to us. So we're on we're on Facebook as Expedition Five. That's the word five, and on Twitter as well. But mainly our stuff just goes on Facebook and Instagram. Okay, awesome, Louis and thanks for thanks for joining me it's been awesome and i wish you luck on the next one or as in getting baffing cracked yeah nice one bro thanks for Oi. having us Cheers, on mate. thanks very much to ant and louis don't forget to subscribe to the podcast if you don't already and follow me and the book of man for the latest news thanks again to talisker for supporting this podcast and thanks to all of you out there for listening thanks a lot see you soon